Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by my frenemy, Dr. Philip Chase, nemesis extraordinaire. Hello, Philip. I'm glad you included the word nemesis there for a minute. I thought I was downgraded to a frenemy. So... <laughs> Is there a hierarchy that I'm unaware of? I think so. Probably. <laughs> so we... We're, we're going to talk today about uh, Wheel of Time, Season 2, Episode 6. And do you remember the name of the episode, Philip? Eyes Without Pity. I was no, just I... reading it on your notes. <laughs> <laughs> would, would that be because I called the actual Zoom meeting room? Eyes <laughs> Without Pity. Yeah. Season 2, Episode 6, Eyes Without Pity. That was a helpful clue. Thank you. <laughs> We are awful at this sometimes. I'm so bad. I just, you know, um, my mother, long before I ever became a professor, called me an absent-minded professor. And it seems to be a, a fairly valid observation. So, yeah, here we are. Well, you obviously, you nailed down the absent-minded bit early. And then you that. had to work. You had to work so hard to get to the professor bit. <laughs> I did. That was the hard part. But when they saw how absent-minded I was, they were like, "You're hired." Yeah. Um, okay. So this this episode this was a very. It's going to be difficult to describe this because it is a very disturbing episode. Uh, yeah. There, there are a lot of elements to it that are brutal, that are harrowing, that are poignant. And yet, you know, we, we frequently use terms like good. Like this was a really good episode of TV. This was a mm. really enthralling and engaging episode of TV. Yeah. And I don't want people to misunderstand. We're not saying, oh, this was really enjoyable in that, oh, I like to watch stuff like this. This was, in many respects, incredibly brutal and heartrending it it was tv that arrested your attention because of how difficult it was to watch that's yeah. so when we talk about it being good i don't want people to misunderstand that we're sitting here going oh yeah i really enjoyed watching people suffering it, right. it's not that but we we will try to make that clear as we go through but for me at least this this episode in what it depicted really got to the essence of by analogy in this fantasy world and what they were depicting in this fantasy world a lot of what we see and hear and experience through domestic abuse mm, yeah so there is one particular thread in this in this discussion and i'll try and f i will flag it up before we discuss it because there are things that i want to discuss about its importance that really are very, very upsetting. And I don't want people to take it the wrong way. And mm -hmm. anyone who has difficulty with that particular topic, um, I'll signal when maybe you might want to just tap out because it, it is deeply unpleasant and difficult subject matter. And It'll be the last, thread, to... we, the last right? thread we talk about. Yeah. We'll make it the last thread. Yeah. 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 Um, so I wanted to put that out at the start because I, I, I will like this was a brilliant episode of TV. This was a, mm -hmm. a fantastic and powerful and emotional and emotive episode. Yeah. But I do not want to sugarcoat the darkness that was is part of this discussion. But in saying that, let's let's start with some of the the earlier uh, sort of threads and we'll we'll build up to that one so uh philip why, why don't we talk about some of the smaller threads like uh loyal and uh ingmar sure yeah so yeah it was interesting to see how adaptable ingmar is proving to be uh as a character he's seemingly blended right in he's now among the slaves taken by the shan chan and and this doing his best not to make waves, although he is uh, talking with Loyal about how to get the horn of Valir. And of course, he's more concerned about the horn than he is about Egwene. And uh, poor Loyal is uh, very much 
representing the more humane side of things. Uh, interesting. He's supposed to be the monstrous one, but he's actually the more humane one um, in that conversation. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I love how they do that. With That's uh, that's loyal in the books, of course, as well. And I love the aspect of him that he's actually the most gentle of, of characters and he's concerned about Egwene. And I love it when he says there's, you know, there's more, I can't remember exactly what he says, but there's more steel under her than, than, you know, people probably under that soft, you know, ex exterior, there's real steel. And if anyone could survive the kennels, you know, it's going to be a Gwen. Uh, so he's trying to help out there. Uh, and I love that moment with Loyal when they demand that he sing, because they've heard of, you know, Ogier singing and stuff like that. And, and of course, it's very mocking when, um, uh, Lady Suroth asks him to do that and everybody's teeing about it. And but when he starts doing it and you see the plant growing and the link they made between that plant and the tree that uh, we're going to talk about later, but the tree that Egwene can see from her prison, very cool touch. Uh, I thought that was really neat. Um, but the fact that he, here he is representing something organic and, and growing and nurturing and um, you know, I thought that was great. Um, and that he's, um, trying to figure out how to survive in this, in this situation, uh, you know, in this society that they've just, they've, they've imported wholesale from their homeland and they're just sort of plopping it here, you know, and they're saying, this is the way things are. Here's the hierarchy. Our worldview is now everybody's worldview. And if you don't like it, well then, you know, um, so yeah, uh, very effectively done through this arc. And of course, because of his his dedication to the most important thing being trying to free a Gwen, he lives up to his name because he is loyal. Loyal. <laughs> um, and and again, as you as you point out, like Ingmar is much more focused on the mission and sacri potentially sacrificing other people to achieve to achieve his objective. Right. There were there were a couple of things that I find very fascinating in this sequence and. Lady Suroth initially basically is showing off her new slaves. Yeah. So through their abilities, they're going to make her look better. She's basically using their power, their talents, who they are, to raise her own position in society. But in that sequence, once Loyal begins tree singing and the various attendants in her little coterie, in her little court, start giving him the attention and become mesmerized in what he okay. is being able to do. Done. Yeah. <laughs> she is immediately incensed because it's no longer adding to her power. It's mm -hmm. now adding to his power, his sense of identity, his, his personhood. And that's not how she wants her Davakal to be. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I think is going to be an interesting point of both comparison and contrast is how the, the Davokel, or however you, that's pronounced, the, the slaves in white, are going to be compared to what the Ail do with their Gaishin. And again, dressing in white and serving as body slaves and servants. And again, it's, it's something that is developed and investigated over the course of the books. Mm. But it's clear with the visual storytelling, there's going to be a very clear link between these two things. And we yeah. can see there are going to be comparisons made between two different societies, one we like and one we hate, but they are both dictated in terms of strict honor codes, strict caste society systems. Right. And the movement between them is all predicated on this interpretation of honor. But again, we like the Ail. And we dislike this colonial power of the Shan Chan Empire. And yet there's a very slim difference yeah. between the two when you actually consider the structures of their societies. And that difference is important, but it's it's not exactly a huge gap. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think this is something that Robert Jordan, I have to say, does really well in the books that he established a sense of cultural history and similarities between cultures that might superficially look very different, but then you realize, oh, there's some common origin here, perhaps, that, that there's no other way to explain these 
similarities that crop up. Uh, and so I, I love that sort of thing. And, and that everyone, I think, if they know much of anything about the books, is that there's extensive world building and a deep sense of history and various cultures but they have all come from somewhere and cultures evolve like languages and things. So there, he, he gives us these interesting little glimpses into origins that I really like. And, and they seem to be paying heed to that uh, here with, with what you're talking about. And, and one last thing about Sarath, when she reasserts her power in that tree singing scene, yeah, yeah. she threatens to basically give loyal away as a gift mm. thereby you know, emphasizing her position of power that he is within her control. But not only that, she refers to Loyal as it. Right. Removes his personhood, removes his status as a living being. And that is something that, again, crops up much later on, and we, we can deal with that later on. But yeah. I think it's interesting that it's exhibited in this scene as well, that this is a common element of this struggle for control and power, which is a theme that runs throughout this entire episode about people making decisions for other people without consulting them, without caring about them, um, thinking that they are always in the better position to decide for someone else. And so many of the points of view and the threads that run through this episode emphasize this time and time again. Um, so will we move on to talk a wee bit about Matt and Min? Surely, yes. And I had a comment from a viewer from our previous discussion uh, that was a, a wonderful comment from a viewer in Brazil who wanted to ask us specifically, and I thought it was a great question, uh, about Matt. And why doesn't Matt admit to Rand that he actually saw a Gwen in the tower? when they meet. So uh, he lets uh, Rand tell uh, him, Rand tells Matt about uh, Gwen, what he knows and how she's in terrible danger, et cetera, et cetera. But Matt never says to Rand, oh, by the way, I saw a Gwen in the tower. And I think it's a great question because it does bring out a certain characteristic of Matt. Uh, I, I know my response to that is of course, Matt is feeling very guilty about the fact that he and and like he sort of was a coward in that moment when he didn't reach out to comfort Egwen because he felt the guilt of abandoning his friends and did not want to confront that. Um, so I think it's the motivation in that case for him keeping silent, or at least we don't see him mention Egwen. Right? He simply questions Rand. What do you? Where? Where is everybody? He knows what he saw Egwen not that long ago. So why doesn't he? Talk about that. I thought that was a great question. So what do you think about that? And then we can talk about Matt and Min more specifically. Well, I think one of the things that plays into this is both character knowledge and character psychology. Um, yeah. So let's deal with character knowledge first, because this would be the way that I would approach it. Matt saw Egwene in the tower. Then he left. But his assumption was Egwene wasn't in the tower on her own, that the others even though he knew Perrin was writing letters, that the others were in some way grouped with her. They just weren't in the room at the time because he doesn't know anything about what happened to them when they went through the gate. Mm -hmm. So he can be making a bunch of assumptions. So he leaves, assuming that Egwene is there. And then Rand turns up and saying, Egwene's in trouble. And he's not immediately going to go, but, but I just saw her because he saw her when he left, we don't know how much time has passed since that. It could be days or even weeks because he's been in Kyrian for at least a short time because he's set up gambling. Um, and from Matt's perspective, again, there's the guilt. When he refused to go with them through the gate in season one, that was through fear. When he doesn't reveal himself to Egwene, that is through shame. And now the third and final time that he denies his friends is in this episode uh, where he does it out of love. So we see this progression. He's moved from fear through shame to now doing it for the right reason. Right. Because he loves his friend and this is now a sacrifice. So you sort of see that rule of three that crops up in fairy tales. Um, sure. And also the biblical illusion of I deny thee three times. 
uh, if a cock had crawn at that moment instead of just a bell ringing, I think it would have been a, a nicer biblical illusion. But for him, A, admitting to himself and working through that guilt, because Rand says to him, um, I thought they would have been better off without me. Mm, if there's an echo of his own thoughts. Yeah. And Matt is confronted immediately because that is what he thought. And he yeah. realizes the lie that he's been telling himself. Yeah. And that takes time to work through. So he could have made the assumption that if Rand had shown up, then clearly he had collected Gwen and Gwen had gone with him because they were a group. They traveled together. Mm. So you have an initial assumption that you could make. You have the, the psychology of not wanting to poke too deeply at the things that we regret, the things that we know are mistakes, the things that we're actually ashamed of. Guilt. And, yeah. Yeah. And trying to not think about it. So it, it all depends on, on where you are willing to sort of extend this because, you know, some people will say that's not good enough and it's not convincing enough, you know, and that's absolutely fine. But for other people, knowing those sorts of elements, you go, yeah, I can understand that psychology. I can understand why he doesn't bring it up. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Another question I have for you. Um, <laughs> when a man and a woman love each other very much, they share a special kind of, Oh, not that question. Okay. We'll, we'll oh, deal with no. that later. No. <laughs> I think I know the answer to that one, but yeah. Um, now this is to do with Min and Matt, uh, who do love each other in a sort of kind of way. By the way, I, I do love the dynamic that they've established between these two and the, the great job that the actors are doing of projecting this dynamic is fantastic. Uh, but I do have a question and it's about Min and her prophecy, if you will, of Matt killing Rand. So she saw this image of Matt killing Rand and she thinks that's why uh, Ishmael wants her to set up Rand with Matt to send them off together so that that will happen. And she feels incredibly conflicted because she's being strong armed into, into manipulating Matt into this position. And she is attached to him. And I love how that comes out and she gets drunk and she's trying to, you know, just escape from this guilt herself. And there's this wonderful friendship that has developed between them that, you know, superficially they tease each other, they flirt, that sort of thing. But there's a genuine warm friendship underneath all that, um, which, you know, it, it leads her to say to Matt, as she's drunk, she's, she's worked herself up to this point, probably, to say to Matt, don't go with Rand. You're going to kill him, right? What I'm wondering is, though, why is Min taking this image that she saw, this prophecy that she saw, so literally... When I think it was established in the, the previous season that not all of the things she sees are, are, they're symbolic, aren't they, on some level? Why does Min take this particular vision so literally and seem convinced that, yes, Matt is just going to kill Rand with that dagger? You know, why can't she see that symbolically? Well, she sees things that happen and they are symbolic things. And how, right. do you, how does she interpret this? Well, there's a significant chance this is literally true where Matt is going to kill his friend Rand or there's a chance that it's symbolically going to be Matt wounding Rand with an evil dagger. Um, <laughs> where, right. where do you come down on that? You go, you know what? 50-50, flick a coin, you're either going to kill your mate or you know it's going to come true in some other way. Right. You err on the side of caution in the interpretation where worst case scenario you are going to kill your best friend okay well why not say i saw this image of you with a dagger was he taking it out of rand or putting it in that, that's another question uh, but i saw this image of you doing this and it might mean that you're going to kill him or i tend to have these visions that are highly symbolic so make of it what you will you know she doesn't tell him that she says you're going to kill rand right because she's convinced herself that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Like how many times? How many times have we been faced with a situation where we have a, a set of data in front of us, an event that has occurred, and we are convinced it can only be seen in one way? And like one of our friends will come up and go, "No, but you could look at this this way." No, no, no. It's it's definitely that we we convince ourselves. And one of the things that this show has has actively leaned into 
right. is the flaws and subjectivity of the characters, making them more rounded and real rather than plot functions operating with omniscient belief. Hmm. And they're leaning into that. That means that people will be not necessarily making the best decision, but they will be making decisions that are psychologically real. She cares for Matt. She knows Rand and liked Rand. And she sees this thing and all she can think about with this image going round and round in her head is this has to be avoided. Added to that, an evil, malignant, dark person uh, forsaken is appearing in her dreams going, mm, yes, go and make them do that. Right. So I should make them do the thing that, A, I don't want them to do <laughs> and could result in one of them dying. And that's what it looks like. And yeah. is also what the evil person wants me to do. Or maybe maybe get Matt not to do that. that I you, think viewer, even viewers who have not read the books have a sense, though. They have knowledge that Min doesn't have, which is Ishmael does not want Rand dead. He wants Rand to make something out of him, it seems. That's his end game here more than anything else it, it appears but men doesn't know that of course right so yeah huh? and and again it's people people do not always make objectively the best decision right quite often subjectivity comes into it where they are operating on certain assumptions and make bad decisions because we're human right. and that humanity that so many of the characters are being given yes it can reduce the the heroic nature of heroes and it can soften the villainy of villains because it's making everyone more human more understandable more uh more connected to how we feel and perceive the world because of that it does kind of soften the things a little bit and it allows that um that sense of error and foible and idiosyncrasy to creep in that can affect people's decision making. That it's it's not the plot function um, dictating what is going to happen. And you know that can be difficult when, particularly when we're used to oh well characters only act in a certain way, but they don't have the information you have. Right, right, right. Um, okay. Anything um, else about Matt and Min that you wanted to bring up? I thought. The, the actor playing Matt, his, his sense of betrayal in that moment when he realizes that Min hasn't just betrayed him. And it, it wasn't even when, manipulating him. Yeah. when they left. And it wasn't even when they first met. That she has been planning on this since before they met. That the entire foundation of their friendship, what given his place of vulnerability, given his isolation, given all of the fears about what he did in betraying his friends. Yeah. And he had found this person and he was finally opening up to people. He was rebuilding himself. And to find out that that is based on a lie, that he has been manipulated from before they met, that betrayal that he shows in that scene was so incredibly powerful and evocative. Sure. Yeah. And to then see it when he is watching Rand. Again, very well done. Yeah. That we, we see the breaking of Matt to a point now that this, I think, is this is the lowest point. And from now, this is going to be the beginning of Matt's redemptive arc because this is the decision point he has betrayed his friends three times that sort of magic number he knows what it's like to be betrayed and rand doesn't get to leave the city which we'll talk about later on and is going to be back in the city so matt is going to get a second chance a second chance also, that he uh, never had before i also wondered though if ishmael hadn't set up min in the sense that he wanted Min. He knew Min was going to ultimately confess to Matt. 
and then he wanted to separate Matt from Rand. And that was the end goal, which he accomplished. Uh, maybe. I mean, that's that's some serious, you know, chess going on from Ishmael's part, which I would I would definitely consider. Well, if if that happened, it would fit. If it didn't happen, that would also fit. One of the, the great things that I, I especially enjoy about adaptation is that they are not bound by exactly what happened in the books. Because oh, yeah. of that, you can still have surprises. You can still have things that you didn't see coming. It's a new variant, a new version of this story that is playing with these concepts. And being able to surprise book readers is is one of the joys of adaptation. Otherwise, everything is just a yeah. repetition of what you've read. And this is one of the things I value in in adaptation. I know not everyone does. And it, it, it's fine to have differences of opinions and desires and preferences in this. But it is one of the things that I enjoy is seeing different ways to achieve the, the very similar goals and, and events. So if it works out that way, we don't know. And trying to judge an entire narrative based on these basically chapters that we are getting. It's like trying to guess the end of Gardens of the Moon when you're six chapters in. Oh, good luck and, with that. <laughs> or, you know, and, and in doing that, you know, we only have part of the story. And Was that a cat? No. No. <laughs> but we, only have, we only have part of the story. And sometimes you require the entire narrative to be shown to really evaluate what was good foreshadowing, what foreshadowing didn't work, what, what threads were beginning to be developed and then got dropped, what threads were seemed to not be going anywhere to suddenly have massive relevance. That it's only when a narrative is completed that you can really get the full picture of it all. And, you know, TV and even these discussions that we are doing on a, on a weekly basis don't lend themselves to that perspective because, you know, we only have up to the point that we are. So yeah. having patience in it to see where things are going and sort of almost withholding final judgment until we see the final product. Yeah. You know, we, we can talk about the things that we like and dislike. We can talk about points of connection that we see, but ultimately we might end up being wrong. Ultimately we, we could end up being proven right. We don't know yet until it is all finished. Yep. Just confirming that that, that was not a fade behind you or something like that, right? <laughs> no, you're the only dark friend around here. <laughs> Wait, dork friend, I think it was. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> if, we, if we were talking about Ashoka, uh, Ahsoka and the, the new Star Wars show, you'd probably be Lord Dork Vader. Probably I would. <laughs> but I would be a good one. <laughs> so. Well, what, what's the next thread that you think we should go on to then? Uh, well, I think Lan and Alana would be the logical place to go from here. And I was uh, sufficiently creeped out by the behavior of Alana and her two warders, Maxin and, oh gosh, what was the other warder's name? Um, Bob? Bob. Maxin and Bob. <laughs> I can't remember his name. I don't know why it slipped me. But anyway, her two warders, they got kind of creepy there uh i felt and when they go to land is like oh this is an interesting place to choose for a campsite hmm uh, a shrine to to uh the forsaken why are we here and then they get like creepier and creepier and they're like <laughs> i'm just wondering <laughs> now they still they're asking him point blank sorry i'm joking <laughs> are you a dark friend land are you a dark friend and I'm thinking, Len, why aren't you asking them the same question here, right? That was exactly the thought that popped into my head. It's like, oh, so this, this Aes Sedai and her warders have taken me to a temple of the Forsaken. Yeah. And start quoting the prophecy about land fear. Yeah. And they're going, oh, are you a dark friend? It's like, look at yourselves. Look at how you're behaving. You, yeah. you took me in, you pretended to be my friends, and now she's bound me in weaves of air. You're threatening to kill me where I stand. Of the group of us, <laughs> who's being sinister? <laughs> and I think this, again, it ties into, A, the subjectivity, 
I would have to say some of the stuff that they've been doing with Lan this season, while it, it has been interesting, it hasn't felt the most relevant. And I think part of it is uh, the actor playing Lan is, is great and Lan is a fan favorite character and they kind of needed something to do with him. Mm-hmm. And it did develop awareness of the warders and the bond and is laying seeds for further on down the line. But this felt finally like a moment when they're going to get Lan back involved in the me in action. Mm-hmm. But that that sequence, the paranoia that is now creeping in to all of the Aes Sedai, to all of these things, and it was something we mentioned before about you know the, the gradual reveal the viewers are having in terms of dark friends being everywhere. Right. That there's a... a level of paranoia creeping in who can you trust and this scene sort of highlighted that but at the same time it did feel a touch bit contrived because he listens and he can hear the oh they're giggling in the tent and it's like oh i'm gonna sneak away and then suddenly it's like oh no that was all of a sudden because we're all fully dressed and ready to to kill you yeah so little tiny uh unease about that particular sequence right but at the same time to be yeah i mean if we're just going to take the way they're being presented in that scene maybe we're supposed to be feeling it from land's perspective like he's increasingly suspicious wait for these three hmm I, I don't know if that's the deal because it seemed like very mustache twirling in that moment to me with alana and the two waters suddenly get really creepy and dark friendy <laughs> and then they want to get moraine why what are they after here actually what is their agenda and they definitely seem to be using land for whatever it is and he doesn't seem to be able to slip them um so yeah but i thought that yeah it was a little too on the nose maybe in that scene yeah. But there were two aspects of this scene and sequence that I liked. Um, one is Alana comes across as frightening and cold and powerful. Yeah. No, and we we saw that very early on when she was teaching the girls that yeah, she appears jovial, she appears this mm. warm, bubbly and, and fantastic person, but she is still a Sedai. She does have that steel to her. She oh, will yeah. make the tough decisions. And in that moment, you realize how much we've been lulled into this very soft, warm uh, consideration of Alana. And we forgot how much of an Aes Sedai she is. She's a green. That's a battle Aes Sedai. So she's and, beautiful, yeah. And so I really like that moment because it, it was shocking and jarring. And I went, why am I surprised by this? Of course. And it was that realization that I'd fooled myself right. into sort of almost dismissing her. Um, and the, the other thing about it that I actually quite liked was uh, because obviously the, it sort of carries on and we see Lan with Swan. So they've forced him to reveal secrets in the same way that he got a secret out of them about where uh, the Amaralyn seat was and is able to act on that. And so there was this very interesting sort of, again, tying into this thing of manipulating others for your own ends. And so thematically, you can see it connect to a lot of the other scenes, making decisions for other people doubting their motivations because you know better. And we had Lan knowing better than Alana, Alana knowing better than Lan. Mm. And it sort of, it tied in to a lot of what is going on here that if only people could trust one another and talk and treat each other humanely, how many fantasy plots would immediately fall apart because of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I... That was the the aspect of it I really liked. Thematically, it connected to a lot of the other sequences, and it showed the the frightening side of Alana. Yeah, agreed, very much. Yeah, so we'll see where that goes. But poor Land seems to be 
being used at the moment and uh, we're not quite sure yet what the agenda is there from Alana and her warders but uh, they're using him to get closer to either Moraine or Swan or both I think um, so yeah and I think that that sort of neatly ties into then talking about Moraine um, indeed so indeed yeah what, what did you think of Moraine in this in this episode and her thread well at first I want to say that I really just want to have a sandwich and a Kool-Aid with Moraine's nephew. <laughs> Especially if he makes the sandwich for me. Um, with the extra butter. With the extra butter, yeah. Uh, I, I love his character. <laughs> I think he's such a, a nice, gentle fellow. Bit sheltered, perhaps. Just a wee bit sheltered. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed how his vulnerability, he's like a hurt little you know, puppy, when Moraine is like, yeah, 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 just leave it here, you know. Um, so he, he, his character has a function of showing us how maybe callous is too strong a word, but Moraine has let her strong sense of duty to, I don't know, save the world, overcome her her personal courtesies uh, to over to basically cause her to become a loner and to be no. It's understandable. She's a bit stressed at the moment. You know, a few things have happened here and the world is at stake and all that. But uh, her lack of empathy for her nephew did in that, in that scene when she says, you know, just put it here. And he he walks away like a hurt puppy. Uh, and then later, it was kind of heartwarming to see her apologize to him and see her human side come out again from that tough veneer that she's been cultivating all this time in order to deal with the very serious things that she's trying to deal with and is overwhelmed um so it was great and she's lost control of rand and that is part of her frustration obviously too and she's trying to just she's lost her power so she's basically in a very like a lose 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 situation here um so it's interesting to see how vulnerable and almost desperate she's become uh, this woman we've seen her very controlled very uh, empowered and to see her character become what it is at the moment is uh, I think it's kind of interesting and, and uh, interesting storytelling. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. There was a, a slight interruption on my end. We were, we were discussing Moraine. Yes. Um, and I think there, for me, there were a couple of really nice moments in this. And the first is when we see Moraine and she's trying to write that letter, we realize she's writing the letter to Swan. Yeah. So not only to her, um, uh, to the Amelin, but also to the woman, the person she loves. And she can't, she's finding it difficult to explain that she has been still. Now, I, I still think that she's been shielded. I think moraine assumes that she's been stilled right but i think that she's been shielded and we suddenly realize that she hasn't been sharing this burden with anyone else she's isolated herself she's been essentially lying through implication and she's been stretched to breaking point she doesn't have the support of swan she doesn't have the support of lan she she is cut off from her magical ability and she is exhausted. She has not been sleeping and she is fueled by her dedication to her cause. And it is causing her to lash out and push people away again and again. Like, and that's what we saw at the beginning of this season with her pushing Lan away. Right. And then we see her do it to her nephew. Yeah. To Barthanes. And her sister calls her out on this behavior. Yeah. And she immediately shuts down her sister. She reacts in anger. And, My house. You know. And bitterness because she, she just, she can't contain it anymore. Right. And then she has time to reconsider. And she realizes that she has been high-handed. She has been making decisions for other people making decisions about what is best for them without asking them, without asking their opinion, without bringing them into consideration. She has been 
dictating other people's behavior. Mm. And there's a crack forms there. And that's when she goes to speak to Barthanes, she knocks on the door and waits a second before entering. Matt did exactly the same thing with Min. Matt mm. knocked on the door and waited for permission. And I thought this was a really nice echo of, of those two moments because this is when Moraine becomes human, much more human, much more willing to admit that, no, she cannot do this all on her own. And yeah. she makes her apology. And she admits her failure and her fault. Barthalus immediately forgives her and he gives her this big hug. And she is shocked by it. And it's in that moment where she, she, uh, Rosamund Pike actually goes, oh, you know, it kind of has this outburst because I think that's the moment where she realizes how much she has missed human contact, human understanding, being part of something other than Judy. And again, I think this, like with Matt, I think this is again another turning point. This is something that is going to be the beginning of Moraine choosing she's still going to be following the same path mm -hmm. or go, uh, trying to attempt to go to the same destination but i think she's going to choose a different path now and not be as cold aloof high-handed and again when we consider a lot of these other threads it is about this dictating for others and assuming that you're always right and it was nice seeing marian admit that she was wrong yeah I like this a lot. And it is something you do see in the books, but it takes longer to happen in the books. So I like the way that they're, they seem to be doing this development for her character within the show, within the parameters that they have in the show. So I suspect there will be book things that will have to be excluded later on. And they're incorporating some of that into her character development here, which I really like. And Barthanus is, uh, moment there is was really heartwarming and she realizes yeah uh compassion you know I, I i have been trying so hard to save the world that i've forgotten the simple act of compassion and it's it's a beautiful moment when she also says to him i think you're going to make a great king barthanus you know i thought that was beautiful um and he might not be a brilliant king but hey maybe a bit of compassion in a, a place of power wouldn't it be such a bad thing in the world, right? Um, and and again, because we're assuming that Maureen still can't lie, she genuinely believes that, which yeah. was, again, something quite heartwarming and very human. Yep. Um, yep. So, you know, there were elements of that that I really enjoyed. And then when she finally commits that letter to Swan, it's... You can see that she has made the decision. She she is owning up to this. And this is the beginning of a new arc for her. So I thought there was good development there with Maureen, which of course brings us on to talk to, uh, about Swan. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, I'm glad to see her back in, in the show. And her front. Yeah. <laughs> her front is good too. Uh, all All's good. Jeez. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, and she put up a good front too there uh, when she was being encountered and uh, it seemed like there was a threat, but it turned out to be just Lan and she had her little invisible daggers ready to go and all that. Right. Uh, so just just on that point, yeah, did you notice that these daggers were kind of like a crown, almost like a crown of swords? Oh. <laughs> it, you know, when when showrunners drop in yeah book titles as a little visual gag and you go it was yeah. a nice little easter egg oh look she has a crown of swords where does that phrase hand, from if you had strewn them along a path it would have been a path of daggers yeah yeah I, i'm sure at some point they're they're going to do little jokes like that so i thought that was actually quite a, a nice book reference but interesting when i was watching this and you heard the sort of commotion and you know she becomes alarmed that there are these riders approaching. Then it goes quiet. There isn't the yeah. sound of battle or anything. And then the door opens and it's land. And on the one hand, you could sort of, you feel, oh, well, that was a bit of a fake out. 
But the thing was, they were honest about it because there wasn't a confrontation. There wasn't the clanging of swords or anything like that. There was a, who's going there? Blah, 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 and then the sound of horses. And then just goes quiet. So you know what happened was he galloped up and went, I'm Alan the Man Dragon, and I need to speak to the <laughs> you, you couldn't wait to say that. <laughs> <laughs> your toe is getting really big man and i don't mean the one on your foot <laughs> and so this i was excited about that particular sequence not only because of the little visual nod to the books but yeah. this is bringing those characters both lan and the amelin to kyrian it's bringing it's moving a lot of the plot sequences forward it's integrating um, the power dynamics. And again, it's Rand in the books isn't exactly trustful of a lot of the Aes Sedai, and that needs to be established. And this looks like it's going to be establishing why Rand initially, you know, is a wee bit distrustful of the Aes Sedai. <laughs> that the that has thing. to be built up. Um, yeah. So having them all there particularly in that number, which is quite threatening, um, that number of Aes Sedai, because they could, they could gentle him. So there's, yeah. there's a real oh. threat there. What a uh, quinky dink. I wonder why Leandrin asks Swan, oh, so bringing 14 with you, eh? You know, yeah. So. Um, I, I did like how Swan basically just dismisses Leandrin. Like Leandrin sort of like, Oh, you know, coming up. And again, the like, brilliant performance of the two of them. And it's just the, the casual, I am so confident in my, go away, you annoying child. I will deal with you later. And again, there's the byplay and the dynamics within the Aes Sedai is something that the show has been playing with and illustrating. And it is engaging. It, it is... I, for me at least, compelling. Yeah, I agree. Well, speaking of Leandrin, do, do we want to move on to her now or no. is there more Swan? Yeah, okay. Well, it'd be interesting to see uh, Swan connect, reconnect with Maureen because obviously that's going to be a fairly fraught conversation. <laughs> It'll be an interesting one. Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. But yeah, the Leandrin had uh, a nice little sequence with Lady Lanfear. Oh dear, yes. That didn't go so well for Leandrin. Uh, well, it went worse for her son. True. <laughs> That's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that was, um, you could see the conflict right there on the screen and on the actor's face playing Leandrin. Like, do I fight this extremely powerful being in order to, I mean, she has no chance and she knows it against Lanfear. Uh, that's, that was illustrated right from the beginning when she tries to zap her and Leandrin's like, boop, you know, and then you get one chance and you try that again, Missy, and I'll give you a spanking. No, wait, there's no spankings in the show. Thank God. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but anyway, she was like very clearly presented from the beginning. It's way more powerful than Leandrin. So Leandrin could have tried to fight her son's life, but it would have been fruitless. And to see that though, still the effort on her face of not protesting, not interfering and knowing and turning her back while her son's breath is being sucked out of him by Lanfear. Very poignant uh, moments there, and, and and almost, almost, almost makes you feel sorry for Leandrin there. Um, so just a again another standout moment that this actor has uh, produced uh, quite a few of in in this season. Really, I think great job of making this character more complicated. In this case, this character is more complicated than the one in the books, as I remember. Um, so interesting, very interesting scene. And, and certainly there were a couple of points of interest for me in this sequence. One is Leandrin and uh, Lanfear both refer to Ishmael by name. Mm. But Leandrin called her Lady Lanfear. And he's like, yeah, well, if you're in her presence, maybe being a bit more polite than normal, Good advice. immediate deference. And then Lanfear 
latching on to Leandrin's fears and biases, her hatred of men, how she's being manipulated by men, how all of those aspects, your son is a weakness and I will do you this kindness yeah. of removing this weakness from your life. Again, making a decision for someone else against their wishes, making that decision for them and pretending you're doing it for their own good. Something we see again and again in this episode. Yeah. And we also see, like, obviously part of this is land fear is undermining Ishmael's power base, taking support away from Ishmael and then gaining that support for herself. So, again, the, the tensions within the camp of Forsaken being ex explored and exposed. A little ironic too, though, is given that Lanfear was just mooning over Rand slash Luz Theron and saying, men are your weakness. Men use us. Men, blah, blah, men, men, men. And then she, you know, just came from this scene with her man, you know, so they're a little ironic there. And let's visit it. Self-reflection, uh, self-knowledge, the ability to know oneself. Mm -hmm. These are massive flaws that we see, particularly uh, a lot of evil characters exhibiting. And they're part of that self-justification, self-rationalization. They're glossing over our flaws or our mutually exclusive beliefs to try and smooth the way to, to make it more compatible and uh, almost just lying to ourselves. We see this time and time again. And again, it's, I think it's part of this humanity that is being added to so many of these characters that make them feel more real. Yeah, and I think there's a deliberate kind of parallel there too, though, with Lanfear saying, this is the last vestige of that young, that youthful Leandrin, right? This is the last tie to your past. Here, let me get rid of this for you. Whereas... For her too, Luz Theron, whom she was in love with in her youth, is also a reminder of her own humanity. And I do like that, yeah, Lanfear for the most part, you know, it looks like a, um, like a total villain, but there is this bit of humanity deep down inside there, this connection to her youth, which is really what Rand, it, it, part of the attraction for her, I think is his innocence and the reminder of her humanity way back when she was in love with Luz Theron. So that's kind of a nice touch. And, and I think you know, it, it does tie into that, the, the very complicated notion at the core of a lot of Lanfear, which is her confusion of obsession yeah. with love. Her, her very twisted and perverted way of caring is about controlling. And... She wants to control Rand. She okay. wants to be the only one in Rand's life. She wants Rand only to be with her. She wants to control all of these different aspects. And yeah. she's not treating Rand as a potential partner. That's visualized over and over again in the show. She ties him to the bed. She, in the dream world, has him tied to the, the wheel. She, you know, wants to be the dominator in this uh, relationship. Dominatrix? <laughs> <laughs> but and again it's about control and if you think her request to run you you aren't allowed to uh, be around Marian anymore yeah well, why because she doesn't want Marian's influence in his okay. life she oh. wants to be the only influence and even when she uh, tempts Rand with seeing Egwene just as Rand is about to reach out to her that's when she tears it away because you can't have that. You can only have me. It's all about control. And when we think of how Marine has been controlling and manipulating Rand, again, for Rand's own good, we see Lanfear is attempting to control and manipulate Rand, but for Lanfear's own good. And so they're, they are mirrors of each other, but subtly shifted. Right. And... Again, when we get on to the Aguin and Rena thing, I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of that as well. That's Again, neat. this aspect of control and manipulation um, and pretending it's love. Mm. And I think that 
that is something that links a lot of what Landfear is doing to, to what we see later on. Yep, brilliant. Yeah, so we brought up Rand. Do we want to continue talking about yeah. him for a moment? Let's, yeah, okay. Let's about Rand. We can talk about Rand. Um, so he's, uh, boy, still, I feel, I, I, I was happy to see him finally getting back with, um, Oh, what's his name? The the uh, the channeler guy who's been uh, gentle. Logan. Logan, thank you. Yeah, I was happy to see him get back, and that was an interesting scene. Um, I I don't know how they're going to handle this. Just that one meeting can't possibly mean that Rand has got suddenly more control over his power. Um, I don't think that was the implication necessarily. There was a bit of a breakthrough, maybe in terms of okay, Rand embrace it don't you know try to run away from it uh so that's an important piece of advice maybe that Logan is imparting there and um, but also he he said that rand had to master it because remember a lot of the right. um the Aes Sedai surrender to the embrace of the yeah, different the approach yeah so this is a very different approach and we we yeah. see Logan going oh yeah more more not that much no, 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 yeah. back, back okay, back, okay. Oh. that's enough yeah <laughs> and it's that moment that Logan realizes he, I, I was a false dragon. Yeah, he is the dragon reborn, or at least closer to it than I was, because he. Well, Rand said, points it out pretty directly. You know, he said, "You thought you were going to change or break the world, but you're not. But through me, you can still kind of have some role here." Um and. On the one hand, it's slightly frustrating that he goes, he has this one sort of lesson and throws up, which obviously is a recurring thing that happens later on when he's trying to use the part because of the taint, which was nice to, to get that sort of foreshadow that, yeah, well, I think we're going to see a lot of Rand throwing up in the in the future, but <laughs> he might as well get the practice in now. Um, the it deal. was slightly frustrating that there's this one lesson and then Rand's like, right, well, now I'm going to go and leave the city. Yeah, that's why I was trying to voice that. Um, but... but but what I find interesting is the potentiality now. So Swan is going to know that Rand is the Dragon Reborn. Yeah. They said die are going to know that he's the Dragon Reborn. Uh -oh. There's going to be schisms within the White Tower about how to handle this. And at least one set of them, including Moraine, is going to say we need Logan to teach him. And Logan yep. is on site. So I think because Rand was stopped from leaving the city, this might be where we get sort of Logan being attached to Rand and Rand's party as to begin his instruction. Now, it could be that, you know, as, as we speculate, he might be taking the role, that function of Asmodian, it, or it, that could play out a completely different way. I don't know. But they're all in the same place, and there's going to be at least some of the Aes Sedai that are going to be on board with Rand being taught how to control his power. Under their supervision, of course. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, so having them all in the same place and Rand not being able to leave yet has sort of, because I was a tiny bit, well, he's just going to leave after one lesson. And now he's sort of, I can see kind of where they're going to go with it because they're building almost like a an infrastructure behind this that is going to be, maybe Lan is going to be part of this to teach him swordplay. Logan is going to be part of it to teach him how to use the par. Mm -hmm. that the and the Aes Sedai are going to um argue about who's going to be in charge of what so i it could work out that way we don't know yet and that's trying to speculate when we only have partial information is always difficult but there are definitely those foundations there that if that's how they're going to do it those foundations are going to build up into that structure very neatly yeah yeah i think it could go there uh so it should yeah. be interesting it'll be interesting to watch um you know well, what did you think of the dream sequence where Ishmael appears and Lanfear then dismisses him? Oh, yeah. I wondered about that, the ease with which she did that. Now, it's been alluded to that she was kind of a, an expert in uh, Tel Aran Rio before, but it was also established that Ishmael has been practicing and actually has some... You know, uh, I feel like Ishmael is the type who is quite comfortable 
letting others assume that he has weaknesses that he's actually worked on uh, and and not letting them know his his strength his his uh, so i think he's allowing some of this to to happen is my suspicion but i don't know what did you think of it would you like to hear my theory of course i would like to hear your theory yeah <laughs> my theory is lanfear set it all up that Ishmael was that it wasn't Ishmael. Yeah. Ishmael was not there. Uh-huh. Um, now, why do I think this? Firstly, when we had that meeting, he's strapped to the, the, the wheel, and she's like, Where are your friends? You're all alone. That was the image she constructed for him in that desert. Um, that he was isolated. What is the image we're immediately presented with here? You've killed all of your friends, you're all alone. Right, right, right. And then, oh, look, it's Ishmael, the big bad guy. And I've appeared to protect you just in the nick of time. Everything about that screams that she has manipulated this specifically to gain his trust, to reinforce that she cares for him. She loves him. She's going to keep him as a little pet. Even says, Uh, oh, but yes, I haven't been honest with you. Right? And so that, now, does it matter if Ishmael had originally done it or if it was Lanfear? I don't think it it particularly matters one way or another. Same effect. Um, But in all honesty, I believe that this was all of Lanfear's making. Uh She created this thing and thematically um, and in terms of the imagery is an evolution of exactly the thing that she did before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and she did it and then protected him from a bad guy. So he would maybe trust her a little more and then, you know, showed a little bit of vulnerability. And I'm sorry. Oh, all the while, each time he's looking away, you see her smile, you see her smirk, you see all of those, <laughs> all of those expressions play across her face. Like yeah. the acting has been superb. I agree. Yeah. Um, and her manipulation and we have been told time and time again this is what she does right so I'm, I'm convinced that this is all about how she is going to break Rand in order to control him and when he says I'll do anything her smile because she thinks she's broken him she thinks she's won right and that's why I think that this was all set up by Lanfear. I think her jealousy of anyone else involved with Rand's life is poisoning her her sense of both who she is and she lies to herself about all these things. Mm. But it is such a, a twisted form of possession rather than love. Yep. And she lies to herself about it. But I, I thought that was the, the big thing about um, that sequence. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, speaking of twisted forms of possession, uh, we need to move on to Falm. There's a couple uh, things going on there. Probably we should begin with Elaine and Nynaeve and Rima and Rima's warder, unless you had something else on Rand. No, um, what was uh, Rima's, Rhyma's warder is it? It's not Barthanus. It's isn't it a name like Barthanus? It's something A L A N, uh, like Basan. Basan, yeah, Basan. I think that's it. So B A S A. I yeah, I, okay. I I guess it was a B name. Okay, you had the the B and I had the A's and the N. So I think between the two of us, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> we are useless. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get there eventually. Yeah. So why, why don't we deal with Elaine, Nynaeve, and Rima before? Because there's the big combat sequence, which I think is yeah. explosive. And there's a lot to be said there. But and yeah. it's very poignant because it's being watched. But one of the things that I really appreciated about this was the development between Rima and Nynaeve. When ah. they're studying the collar, it, it's interesting that Elaine is the one leading the study, which, you know, it's a nice nod. What really made these sequences nice for me is Rima is the first Aes Sedai to think of Nynaeve from Nynaeve's perspective. She acknowledges, she acknowledges that she is a wisdom. Yeah. 
Raima is a yellow, a healer. She recognizes a kinship. Mm. And even when she is sort of uh, saying goodbye to Naive, asking, this, she says, wisdom, Naive, sister. She is the first one to treat Nynaeve as an equal, not about her power, yeah. not about what she can be for the tar. She treats Nynaeve as a person and recognizes that kinship. And she's the first one to try to explain how to connect to uh, the one power in a way that makes sense to Nynaeve. Think mm -hmm. about when you're wanting to heal a patient, you, you don't think about it. You go to the patient. Like, yeah. She puts it in a frame of reference that Nynaeve can understand. There is true understanding of Nynaeve as a person. And think about all of those things that I've been saying about all of these other threads where it's about assuming you know better than the other person. Mm -hmm. This is the complete inverse of that. It's of treating the other person as a person, trying to see from their perspective and understand them and elevate them in terms of personhood. And that is why I think the juxtaposition of the sequence at the end with obviously what uh, Egwene goes through is so powerful. This is the counter argument. This is the opposite. This is, mm. this is what happens when you trust and engage with people. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so powerful, particularly in this episode. Yeah, Raima was a great character. Uh, I, I, I like the dynamic that very quickly develops between her and initially there's a lot of distrust and a lot of uh, she's saying, OK, you two, you're going to go back to the tower. And then they're like, no, no, we're not. And and that was a nice, nice little moment of bonding between Nynaeve and Elaine, who had been kind of disagreeing about uh, things. Um, but there was a nice just a look exchanged when Elaine agreed with Nynaeve and said, no, uh, thank you for your concern, but we're staying. And Nynaeve was like, yeah, you know? So that was a nice little exchange between them and the dynamic that grows as they together try to figure out this thing, this torture instrument, the, the collar and all of that. Um, and the, uh, the background we get, we learn about what happened to that blue from season one who was sent off to find out what's going on at Falm. You know, we, we get... To, Gosh, what happened to her? That's horrible. But yeah. And there, there was a very, very nice moment, actually, where, you know, uh, Rima shows them the three rings and then obviously gives the rings over into their safekeeping. Yeah. And you're like, well, that would be kind of handy if anyone, for whatever reason, wanted to pretend to be an Ace to Die later on and didn't have their own Ace to Die ring. That's, that's going to be convenient. Got a spare or two, even yeah. You know, yeah. and so again, that was a a nice moment. But again, the the trust, the confidence, and the respect that Rima shows Nynaeve, I I think I cannot overstate that because yeah. even though Nynaeve accidentally uses too much power, which alerts the Damine. That's also the breakthrough moment. So, yeah. She, they get the insight in uh, an insight into how the colors work. But even with that, Rima doesn't blame her. Right. Rima accepts that. And, says, and knowing no. all the while what needs to happen next, too. Right. Very calm. I love that character. Yeah. Uh, and that actor did a stunning job. I, I think people are going to praise uh, the actor who plays Egwene, quite rightly for, for her scenes, but the actor who portrayed Rima did such an incredible job because you see the warmth and the steadiness and the calmness. And then in the, the sequence with Bassan where they are fighting, mm. she has this look at Bassan and just winks. And it is such a wonderful moment and it tells you so much about the depth of relationship again between warder and a sedai yeah then we see her her par in what she does and we think oh what's a healer going to do mm -hmm. and we realize what what a healer can do is invert healing make you into a contortionist well it's 
I know how to straighten and fix broken bones. But right. if I invert that weave, that reverses it. So I can take a straight bone and make it a crushed bone. Right. I know how to cure rashes and diseases, but that also means I know how to inflict them. Yeah. And what she unleashes, it, it shows, again, the power of it. And something we don't think about in terms of healing. If you understand how to fix something, you also understand how to break it. Yep. And then when Bassan dies, the switch in her emotion to the rage and the pain and the absolute despair. Mm. And that's when she loses control and we see her just absolutely destroy people. Out of and grief. Yeah. Although, interestingly, she targets not the Domine, but the Soldom, right? Knowing, uh, I mean, she knows who's really controlling what's going on here, right? So, I, and that, that's perfect, because again, like, even, even in her rage and despair and grief, yeah. she's, she's still somewhat in control. She still identifies the dangerous party. She's, right. she's not targeting an innocent channeler. It's intelligent too because I think she realizes the Domine suffers when the Soldom suffers, right? So yeah, strategic, but also putting the uh, attacking where the aggression is coming from, you know. Uh, so, and with her being collared at the end, mm. that despair was heartrending. It's awful, yeah. I, and and that that is going to take us on to. Uh, discussing, I think, the most disturbing sequence in this show. So any, yeah. anyone who, who finds this difficult, thank you very much for watching. Um, the sequence with Egwene Igu and, and Rena is very, very disturbing, and I, I don't want anyone to be upset by it. So mm. thanks for watching, and we'll, we'll catch you in the next one. So Philip, um, let, let's talk about Egwene and Rena. Um, do you want to start off on this? Sure, yeah. Uh, as you say, uh, it's torture, uh, both <laughs> to watch and uh, it is torture in terms of what uh, Rena does to Egwene. And it's trying to strip her mind and dehumanize her and tell her, you're not a woman, you're a domine. Uh, you are not a human being any longer, or you never were even a human being. So here's here's my worldview in my worldview that I've grown up in and that I that I'm inflicting on you. You are not human and you have to accept that. And she has this power over her because of that that uh, instrument of torture, which we learned through Elaine that it wants to be healed. Interestingly, the collar and the only way to do it is to be put on. A channeler um so that's i thought that was a fascinating little insight right uh but anyway yeah the the dynamic that develops between them uh very disturbing and very uh, much a uh, an attempt to usurp power is power is a huge part in any relationship that includes abuse power is going to be at the heart of it and it is clear that rena probably believing that what she's doing is right even is laying claim to power is taking it from a dangerous place and putting control on it and giving it to herself which is in her view much better hands than letting this wild creature use this power uh in the process we see her dehumanizing Egwene. we see her uh manipulating her through what she has over her with that whole cup and the the, uh, the pitcher. And we see her own investment in this, particularly when Egwen isn't a, uh, a good girl or a good creature, uh, when she doesn't succeed in pouring the water you know, again and again and again, that she's showing that she, how stubborn she is and how she is resisting this, this uh, attempt to strip her mind and, and replace her humanity uh, with this identity as an instrument, as a weapon, as a tool. Uh, so it's powerful stuff. And we see Rena's rage come out 
and like an abuser's rage at any sign of disobedience or any sign of that of resistance to the narrative that the abuser is attempting to impose any sign of resistance to that narrative sparks the rage because they realize oh there's a fear there i don't have control over this person and and to assert it through just brutality is what happens there that rage comes out and she asserts her control just through sheer brutality until she grinds Egwen down. Uh, and it's the, the hardest part is when Egwen finally does pour the water and realizes I've given in. I have, um, I've, 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 I've allowed this person to make me into something that I didn't want to be. And that is just an awful moment. That was the hardest part of the, the show for me was when Egwen, her grief at the loss of her identity in that moment as she perceives it. Uh, and the poor woman next door, the blue, who had been captured earlier saying, well, you lasted longer than I did. You know, man, that was poignant. Um, and th this to me was so particularly brutal because I saw so many parallels to domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, Rena assumes the position of abuser even the the in, uh, in that initial exchange what is your name and then torture to get the name and then rena says i i see no reason not to let you keep it you know, it's not up to you Good. she's saying i could take your name if i want yeah and so you realize that even from the very beginning this whole you know i think we can be friends no you, you this is not about that that is all faux that is all uh, projection that is all a self-rationalization that Rena thinks of herself as being good and again like we saw this with um lady sorok where it was about manipulating loyal in order to self-aggrandize in order to build up her own power i own this thing we see this with Rena, and i think the actor playing Rena did a stunning job with yeah. something that is so difficult, so detestable, that ordinary people like us just can't imagine that psychology that she was having to get into the mindset of in order to portray, that this is just so alien to us to treat another person and think of them, they are not a person. They are an animal. They have always been an animal. And they might be able to talk back but they're an animal and that animal belongs to me and all of their positive attributes, all of their power, that is mine, mm. mine by right. And that is just so, so alien, a concept to apply to a human being. And we, we see that, you know, she, Rena feels sad that Egwene isn't learning quickly enough. And then it's like, well, you are strong and spirited, as if she is some kind of horse to be broken. Mm. We, they, they even refer to this building as the kennels, because that's where you keep your dogs, your attack dogs. And I think one of the clever things they did with this was the focus on the water pitcher as mm. the symbol of everything. And it was very similar to an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, which I think was called Chain of Command. But it's the one where Picard is being tortured and it's a lot of physical torture followed by psychological torture. And he keeps being asked when he's being shown the lights, how many lights are there? And he's like, there are four lights. And it's like, no, 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 there are five. It's 1984 is what it is. Yeah. Um, and f the fixation on the lights in that episode, again, that was the symbol for whether or not the person was, was broken. And yeah. the picture is all all of that symbolism wrapped up because even when Egwene reaches for that picture and pours it, this it's never been about that because Rena just pours the water away. It's yeah. not about that. It's about power. It's about domination. It is about breaking the other person. And it is so incredibly cruel and callous. And yet in it, Rena feels that she is perfectly entitled, perfectly justified. And we see that moment when she gets Egwene to channel into the tree. The one little bit of solace and beauty in the situation. Yeah. And she gets Egwene to destroy it. 
It even says, I know that gives you comfort, right? And this creepy, detached, you know, her, her eye, the, I, like you said, the actor does a phenomenal job of portraying this almost like alien presence where, uh, yeah, her eyes are blank almost. And she's, her voice is very, most of the time until that anger comes out, uh, really well done is this detached kind of rational, I know you, you it gives you comfort, you know, and we and, know, oh no, what's she gonna do this poor tree, you know? And it's in that moment where she gets a grain to destroy the tree. Rena actually says, um, that's how it's supposed to feel. Ooh, for this who? is the power we are meant to wield, Egwene. Did that's you feel it? Our affinity. Stuff. Yeah. And when you think about the situation, this is Egwene's power. It is all Egwene's power. So Rena's Egwene like a can parasite. do this. She's being a parasite. Yeah. Egwene can do this without Rena. Yeah. But for Rena to do it, she needs Egwene. And we know from earlier on, when people talk about touching the source, when they talk about touching the power, mm. that it's beautiful and wonderful and it makes you feel powerful. And this is Rena's way to access that. And she feels that she is entitled to that access. And therefore, because Egwene has this power, well, it's rightfully hers. And that train of thought she then goes do you feel our affinity it's yes as you point out a parasite sucking the power from you and being able to to take this from you and that's my right and it do you feel how good that is which is obviously the feeling of controlling this power right, that's right. why this is that's why this is meant to be right. that lie that justification is is so brutal and then as a reward for this she tests Egwene again to pick up the picture and Egwene fails. And Rena's reaction is to beat her physically. And in that moment, all I could think of was that refrain of, look what you made me do. Yep, yep. If, you'd only, if you'd only done this right, look what you made me do. That which we hear so often right. in, in these stories. And that's why this was so brutal to watch because yes it's about slavery yes it's about abuse and torture but the parallels of this psychology to the modern day are so stark it does take on overtones of sexual abuse yeah uh, um and and even the you know the the good girl and the patting her head mm. everything it was so brutal and incredibly difficult to watch yeah. And because it was contrasted and intercut with Rima fighting the um, the other Damine and Suldan, it ends on such a dark note. Mm. Egwene has been broken. Rima has been collared. That we see these people, these wonderful people and characters being enslaved and destroyed and broken and it is such a dark note and there's so much resonance to today not just to our world and our world's history to right. today yeah and i think that's part of the power of fantasy storytelling that we, we take these things we put them into a fantasy world we protect ourselves somewhat from the direct impact so that we can see them and process them but ultimately we we come back to this world we take it back with us and it can be eye-opening to understand it in that way and it's, it's one of the one of the reasons why i like studying fantasy literature because of this ability to explore these things in a way that makes them emotionally understandable to people that otherwise may not be open to to thinking about them. Psychic distance you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well said. Uh, yeah, so this was the uh, darkest episode, I think, of the season. Uh, two more episodes to go, I, I guess. Uh, so uh, I'm expecting things to really go down big and fall. Uh, we shall see what happens. And 
hopefully uh, we see some of our our uh, our protagonists rallying a little bit here uh, because this was a tough one. This was a really tough one. Yeah. Um, and you know, Phil, thank you very much for joining me. Like this, we we I think leaving that to the end to to allow people to to tap out, as it were, uh, is important. But it does mean that we ended on on a really really dark note. Yeah. And like I I appreciate you discussing this with me. It it's not easy to discuss these topics. No. Um, and when you think of the power of a mainstream TV fantasy show to touch on this, to illustrate this, to communicate this, that that is powerful and I appreciate that the show didn't shy away from this. Mm-hmm. They they took something that was related secondhand memory. Someone because I think it's a Gwen describes it. Oh, this is what happened to me. We don't see it live on the page. That it's described secondhand, and we're protected in the the literature from this. Even though we we can kind of imagine it, there's no shying away from seeing it on the screen, mm. and. I'm in some respects glad that they they showed this because it it is important and brutal and powerful. So thank you very much for for joining me, Philip. And pleasure. For those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And we will see you in the next one.